The S&P 500 ended the week looking very strong pretty much right across the board and this week we have a chance for some very large volatility. We have some very big names across some very important industries that are reporting. So something just to be aware, this earnings season has now pretty much started. And in terms of today's episode, we are focusing on the Hershey company, which is trading right there towards its 52 week low. And it does offer a forward yield that is near the 3% mark. So is this a cheap bargain in what looks to be an overly inflated market? As we can also see, it is trading at a forward PE below 20 S&P 500 right now sitting around 25. So let's find out in today's episode why in fact this company has crashed because over the last 10 years whilst it is up 102 percent we notice it has come down all the way from its all-time high around a year ago at 275 dollars so is this undervalued and also let's get to our own valuation we do want to point out though seeking alpha wall street and quant do give this company a hold now one of the reasons for the drop in the share price we notice the cocoa prices which are in fact one of the main ingredients that the Hershey company use has been increasing over the last few years in fact we see it go from the 2023 position all the way up in fact to April 2024 at a very rapid rate and although it has started to cool down towards the end of this year we still note it isn't anywhere near the levels that we did see in all of 2023 so one of the reasons and something just to keep an eye on to ensure that these costs do start to come down and remember this is a company that has some very large brands throughout big names that you would have heard of for example Reese's we have Hershey's itself Kit Kat icebreakers and a few new ones that have entered into their top 10 brand portfolio we have skinny popcorn as well as dots pretzels now we also want to let you know that historically or at least over the last 10 years their organic revenue is up around 3.7 percent year on year remember we want to see around four percent in terms of these numbers just to keep up in line with inflation and that is something that we can see with their top line revenue their earnings per share up double digits 10 percent year on year looking very good and their average free cash flow growing 11 percent also looking fairly favorable now we want to discuss something that's very important that moving forwards out of the next four quarters they are anticipating three of those to be growth one of them to be negative Negative. and when we do look back over the last four whilst they do have a 75 percent track record as they have beaten three of the four they did miss by around 18 cents in the more recent quarter of q2 and something that we don't typically see on this channel over the next full year they are expecting the earnings per share to decrease to 924 as we can see that will increase the forward p to just above 20 so lots of things that we need to consider with this company obviously we do start to paint the picture of why this company has started to falter and another thing that isn't really good news they did revise their 2024 full year outlook and they revised it unfortunately to the downside so top line was around two to three percent growth now they're saying they expect the lower end of two percent they expected eps share growth as well to be around zero percent we can now see they expect it to be negative one to three and if you are looking for the adjusted rate of zero percent they are expecting very similar to the reported rate to be a decrease so not looking great one of their main ingredients has increased rapidly over the last year we see they have lowered their full year guidance and they expect their earnings per share over the next full year to be a decrease so we're understanding why this company is faltering but what about the underlying metrics can this company turn around this very poor corner now dividend safety score 80 it does look to be safe severe undervaluation on the yield we'll take a look at this further severe undervaluation on the forward p again we'll take a look and very nice to report in line with this company as a whole they have increased the dividend by a double digit rate of 15 percent in february this year now in terms of dividend safety was reaffirmed in august this year ultimately safe score means that a dividend cut is unlikely now the key metrics this is from the last recession 0709 they actually maintained the dividend they didn't increase it they also didn't cut it they had pretty much flat recession sales but this was well above the average of the smp that sat at negative 12 and they also severely outperformed the smp negative 30 however the smp itself negative 55. as we can see we do quite love this company in terms of the dividend growth double digit this year double digit over the last five years and double digit over the last 20. 
We also note they have been increasing those dividends for 14 years consecutively, whilst paying a dividend without a reduction for the last 94. So in terms of the valuation model, which compares the current PE with the average historical, when we do look over the last year, we actually note the whole 12 months prior, this company has been trading well below the blue tunnel, which essentially shows us the expected fair value. So, so we can clearly see there is undervaluation here, and we'll take a look in more detail in our own model later. Now, in terms of dividend yield theory, this tells us a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average. So we have a severe undervaluation signal here, 2.95 above the 2.06. We also see the forward P at around 20, significantly lower than the five year rolling of 24. However, we do know it is above the consumer staples as a sector of 17.7. Regardless, we're not looking at any one of these models in isolation. And as we already mentioned, we will take a look when we run it through our valuation. Now, free cash flow power always over the earnings, which is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting, below 70% for consumer staples, pretty much what we see for the majority of the last 10 years. 59% in 23, 59% anticipated over the next 12 months. So we would be surprised if we don't see a very favorable increase in February next year. With free cash flow, we want to see consistent increases over the longer term. And we pretty much see more than triple over the last 10 years, 213 to 758. Very nice to see that over the next 12 months, we also expect some strong growth to $9.30 per share. And with the sales growth, ideally 3 to 7%. Remember, at the bare minimum, 3 to 4 just to keep up in line with inflation. Last three years have been very good, but do remember they did lower their guidance. And for 2024, they are now expecting 2%, which is marginally lower than, as we say, the inflation rate we want to target. From a numerical standpoint, though, we can, in fact, see they have increased their top line by around 50% over the last 10 years. And whilst we do like to focus on shares outstanding, we love the companies that return excess cash to investor pockets through those share buybacks. They've done very, very minimal year on year, so I wouldn't really incorporate this into your investment decision or in fact your analysis. ROIC, 12% or more for consumer staples, very good numbers, very high, whilst it has decreased, still in the mid to upper 20s over the last six years. And this is definitely something we love to see as investors. This does give us faith that management are able to effectively allocate their capital. And the operating margin, always great to see a company that is above the minimums and increasing, even though marginally, still we get a sense of operating efficiency. On the free cash flow margin side as well, above the 7% year on year. So they do have some very high quality metrics. And another one of those being the net debt to EBITDA, the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. Below four is what we want to see. That is what we get. And with the number of years below showing us the number of years it would take Hershey to pay off all of their debt net of cash in hand. Very nice to note, 1.4923, a small increase to 1.72 over the next 12 months. But it just goes to show us their balance sheet does look good and the dividend safe, as we already saw, does look to be secure. We've just also released our latest free weekly article. We drop one every single Monday morning where we talk about what's happened in the market over the last few days, as well as any undervalued stocks that we do believe deserve your attention. So you can click on the pinned comment below, sign up, read straight away, where you will also be able to gain access to 36 undervalued dividend stocks for the month of October. We talk about each one in detail. We talk about the upside expected from Wall Street. We also flag those that sit within our own portfolio. And for this month as well, you can grab 22 dividend stocks that Wall Street themselves believe have the most upside out of the S&P 500. So click below, sign up, and you can read straight away. Other parts of our analysis include looking at insider ownership, 0.34% where we see just over 3 million worth of sales over the last year. But we do know no buys or sells in the more recent quarter. In Q3, 393,000 worth of sales. And in Q2, we see a little bit more. Now, it is a little bit outdated and for full transparency, we will show you, but we just want to flag that ultimately we don't believe this is a bearish signal. In fact, we can see the most recent sale on the 12th of August was by the CAO where they sold around 538 shares for a very minimal amount. 
Remember, they will sell for many reasons, like personal and financial, so we wouldn't weigh this too heavily on the overall decision. In terms of the institutions, with around 58% ownership, 12.6 billion worth of sales over the last year, with a lot less in terms of buys over the same time period, which is very interesting, not something we always typically see. In the more recent quarter, however, we do know more buying than selling, as well as pretty much all in 2024. The largest sale did come in Q4 of 2023. So overall, we can see in the more recent period, institutions are bullish they are buying however over the last 12 months we do notice they have sold a lot more as always do your own due diligence never copy what these institutions or insiders do now in terms of looking at the income statement we already highlighted the top line growth around 50 percent over the last 10 years but here we want to talk about the story of the bottom line net income What's the story to be told? Well, we noticed actually very nice. It has pretty much been consistently increasing over the last 10 years, around 847 million in 2014, 1.86 billion in 2023. So this is a good sign. Top line revenue increasing for the large part, as well as we can see the same trend on the bottom line. That is something that we do like to see. And you would be surprised how often we don't actually get this signal when reviewing companies on the channel. Now, in terms of a quick health check, total cash versus total debt, we do notice their cash has been very, very inconsistent, and it has gone from 472 million in 2014 to not far off the same amount, actually, 10 years later at 467. Now, remember, in isolation, this number doesn't tell us anything, and we're doing a very quick health check, so we are comparing it to their total debt numerically and directionally, which we have noticed has increased over the longer term from around 2.2 billion to 5.8 in the latest quarter. But as we saw, the net debt to EBITDA does still look very healthy for now. It is in fact below two, so no worries. But again, these are things that you can flag to analyze on a quarter by quarter basis. Now, moving into some of the gradings, the valuation, they get a C minus. In terms of the PE around 20, we do notice it is marginally higher than the sector as a whole of 18 which basically means if you are buying Hershey right now, you are paying a 10% premium. Is it worth it? Well, that is the question you need to ask yourselves and how much of a premium if it is truly deserved. We also note whichever valuation metric you use, for the most part, Hershey is trading at a premium. We then move on to the growth where they get a C minus. Not that great to see, especially given it is trading at a premium to the sector. We can see here the growth on a year on year basis at 1.4 isn't too far off the sector at 2.27 and forward looking at 3.8 is pretty much in line. So growth forward looking and over the last 12 months hasn't looked that particularly great in an isolation point from just Hershey as well as in comparison to the sector. And when we do look at it in terms of over the next three to five years, we do notice the EPS is anticipated to grow at around 2%, whereas the sector as a whole, 8% is a lot better. So really, we do need to start questioning, is it actually worth a premium? Now, in terms of the profitability, we get an A-. minus. We can see a gross margin looking a lot better, 45% versus 36 In terms of the bottom line as well, significantly better at 17% versus 433 And we also note cash from operations on a trailing 12-month basis, 2.17 billion versus 757. Now, as we already mentioned, we do get a triple hold rating right across the board, a C minus on valuation, C minus on growth with an A plus on profitability. So let's compare this company against others in the sector and understand is this an issue isolated to the company or in fact, does the sector as a whole have issues? So we have General Mills, Kraft Heinz, Dannon, as well as a few well-known others. And what we notice over the last 12 months, Hershey has been the worst performing pretty much flat and this does include reinvesting those dividends. When you zoom out and look over the last five years, we notice it has performed a little bit better, but not that great at all. The fact that it is in the middle of the competitors, around 33%, does tell us that pretty much the industry as a whole has been very poor. And when we zoom out over the last 10 years, we can see much better up 154, the second best. Nonetheless, you could argue over the last 10 years, you would be looking for a much better return. Remember, though, that the past performance will not give us any indication of how they perform over the next 10, 15, 20 years. In terms of comparing against the S&P, because ultimately, if you don't have faith, it will outperform. You're better off just investing in the low-cost ETF that tracks the S&P. 
Over the last year, we see massive out. Over the last five years, again, we see a very similar scenario. Over the last 10 years, what's interesting to note is that whilst the S&P has outperformed, there were moments, especially over the last year, where Hershey had significantly outperformed. So always interesting, I guess, by investing in the S&P 500, you do get a bit more of security than investing in individual stocks. Now let's jump into the valuation. And as always, if you do enjoy the content, values being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Now our intrinsic value of $211 came from these three models. The first one, the multiples valuation, companies in a similar sector and size. The average P multiplied by the EPS of Hershey, that gives us an intrinsic value that isn't pretty much off the market price, although we do get an overvaluation signal. Remember though, we don't look at any one model in isolation. We then have the dividend discount model where we have average growth of 12%. As we've already said, this company does love increasing these dividends at a double digit rate. We have gone a lot more conservative though, moving forwards at 5.5, and we do get our first undervaluation signal today. We then move on to the DCF model with the free cash flow year on year, average growth around 18%. Moving forwards, we've gone for around 10%, a little bit more on the conservative side. With the discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. When we add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get TXP value, and divide by the shares outstanding, we get our second undervaluation signal. So ultimately, the intrinsic value today is just the average of these three that you see on the screen. Now, we do always like to use a margin of safety on this channel where we start off with 10% and execute if it meets our three golden criteria, wide moat, strong financial metrics, and good forward-looking data. Now, if you believe that in today's episode, at a 10% MOS, a buy at $190, then we keep going to it's near the current trading price. And what we see right now in today's episode, Hershey is pretty much trading in between a 10 to 15% MOS. For some people, that is enough. For others, they will be looking for a lot more. So let's just keep going at 20%, a buy around 170, and at 25%, a buy at 158. As always, though, do give us your thoughts in the comments below. And remember, you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below, running through your own numbers, whether it's for Hershey or any others that you do desire. We can also see that Wall Street have a price target of $205 over the next year. As we said at the beginning, they do give this a hold rating as they only see around 10% upside over the period. As always, though, do give us your thoughts in the comments below. Is this one you are looking to buy? Maybe waiting for a further drop or maybe not at all. And this isn't essentially an area that you want to have in your portfolio. If you enjoyed the episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to sign up to the free weekly newsletter and come and join us in the Patreon where we do talk about our weekly buys and sells. As always, have a great day and we'll see you all on the next one.